Chrysalis. Man, what, what in the world would a pastor name a, a, a series Chrysalis for? Uh, we know the chrysalis, right? It's the place where the caterpillar enters into. He surrenders himself to so that he can come out the other side as a new creation. Brand new even to the place of its DNA, uh, in, in the place of its service, in the place of its existence. It's brand new from caterpillar to butterfly. But it happens, right, in the chrysalis. You want your life new today? Uh, this is the study for you. If you've missed the first several weeks, you can find them online. We hope that you will. But today, we're going to be looking at, at what our chrysalis really is in the place of faith. In the place of faith. What is our chrysalis? Well, if you've got your notes before you, Christ is. Listen to the way Paul says it as we look in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 13. Colossians chapter 2 Verses 6 through 13, it's printed there, you can look it up in your word, uh, but, but listen to the number of times in just these few verses that Paul directs us to the chrysalis. Listen to what he says. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, get that in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and in, in, in overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception that is according to the tradition of men and according to the elementary principles of the world rather than, accept, uh, than, than according to Christ. For in verse 9, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in, you were, uh, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. In verse 13, when you were dead in your transgressions, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our transgressions. Let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the reading of your word today and the hearing of it. And do that work in us that only you can do. Transform us as we rest in you. Some of us, Lord, in the brokenness of spirit. Some of us, God, in, in, in the uncertainty of, of conditions of life. Some of us, Lord, on the mountaintop and full of joy. We all come to you today needing one thing, and that's to be received unto yourself, to be, to be hidden in you, to be placed in, in the shadow of the cross. Make us new today by faith in Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Ronald Reagan, one of our former presidents, wrote this, and I, I thought it was appropriate for today, seeing as how this week uh, we, we memorialized an event, a, a tragic event in our nation's history uh, that, that brought all of us as, as, a, as a collective group, as Americans, it brought all of us to this place of fear. Some of you say, well, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid on, on September 11, 2001. Well, uh, you, you, may, you may have been in a different place than I was. But September 11th is kind of like the, uh, the, a monumentous event that you, you could probably, if you're old enough, you remember exactly where you were, right? Pearl Harbor. My dad tells me about Pearl Harbor in December 7th. He said he couldn't remember where he was when he heard the news of what happened and how they gathered around uh, that, the radio at that time to hear what was going on in Hawaii. Pearl Harbor was an event for a, a generation past. 9-11 is this generation's point of resolve and at that point I can remember sitting in Lincoln to North Carolina and, and, and being there in a revival service with a church and wondering uh, what was going on we were supposed to be going to the gym and I get a call uh, from, from the, the young man who was, who was there in the household the pastor's son Micah Haithcock Micah said uh, Pastor Charlie you need to come here I don't know what's going on but, but the World Trade Center's on fire and we walked in, and in a matter of minutes, we watched the second plane. Live on TV, we watched. And the second plane hit the tower. And I don't know where you were and if you were able to see that sight, but at that moment, my stomach just wrenched. 
a knot formed. This nauseous feeling. Recognizing that the first plane was no accident and there was actually a, an enemy that was targeting our country. Knowing, have, having been there in, in the very shadow of those trade centers just a few years before, knowing how massive those buildings are and watching the tens of thousands of people over 10,000 people worked in the building, but tens of thousands of people would enter in and out of the trade centers. There were actually seven on the complex. Watching that moment, fear captured our nation. And then anger. And then a resolve came from, from that that pushed us into a unity to attack the enemy the enemy was identified and, and I can remember as President George Bush uh, stood out on a, on a mound of the rubble and, and with a bullhorn called out across the people we will find out who did this and we'll pursue them and call the American people to prayer in that place of, of, of resolve there everyone was, we were calling we still call for, for our military to be great but Ronald Reagan years before <clears throat> after another attack upon our nation Ronald Reagan brought into, into perspective what it takes to battle against fear whether it's fear that, that attacks a nation or fear that attacks a man or a woman's heart here's what Reagan said regimes planted by bayonets do not take deep root our military strength is a prerequisite to peace but let it be clear that we maintain this strength in a hope that it will never have to be used. For the ultimate determinant in the struggle that's now going on in the world will not be bombs and it won't be rockets. But the ultimate determinant is a test of our will and our ideas. It is a trial of our spiritual resolve the values that we hold, the beliefs that we cherish, the ideals to which we are dedicated. Reagan saying, our faith will make the difference in the battle that we have against the forces of this world that mean harm. Today, we need to go to the chrysalis. In, in a place of remembrance, in a place of understanding, it's a remembrance of what happened then. But there's a great enemy that attacks even to the soul of the man and the woman. The word says that he seeks to devour. That he prowls. And, and, and whether or not we are aware of it, there are, there are attack after attack. It's, it's, being, it's being given the picture in the word as it's fiery darts. Every time I hear that scripture now, I can't help but have the, the vision in my brain come out as being those buildings on fire. That we have a great enemy of our soul. And so we need a great place of resolve. And it won't be found in military might. It will be found in the place of your faith. Your faith brings you to understandings. Know this. Here are some of the understandings that faith wants to bring you to. Number one is that God wants good for you. In a place of fear, we have doubt of that. And when doubt begins to take root, we begin to give up hope. But God desires good for you. If you're a note taker, the blank that's left there for you, that term, for you. It's not just that God has a desire for the whole world, but God has a desire for you. And in that desire for you, he wants to establish a foundation. He wants to establish a strength. Because if you will embrace the good that God has, Kendall, if I embrace the good that God has for me, it's going to benefit Connie. And if Connie and I embrace the good that God has for us, it's going to impact Bethany and Andrew. And if Bethany and Andrew embrace the good that God has for us, then it's going to impact, uh, right now, Southern Wesleyan University. And if Southern Wesleyan University takes it, right? Scott, if you embrace the good that God has for you, it's going to infect Matt. And if Matt in, in, in takes it and invests in it, it's going to affect South Davidson High School. You get it? 
God desires good for you. And out of that good that, that finds its foundation of faith, he changes the world. One single person at a time, he, he wants it for you. And his good, though, is sometimes found in hard places. You say, Pastor, I love that. We, we could almost say, shout hallelujah, that he wants good for me. But right now, I'm in a bad place. You don't know the addictions that haunt me. You don't know the anger that wells in me. You don't know the circumstances that are defeating me. You don't know the, the mental anguish that I go through. How can God bring good in that? Well, God desires to bring you good even in the hard places. Romans 8 tells us that, that our God, He works all things together for good. For those who love Him and are called or pursuing according to His purpose. Those who follow in faith and trust, even when, when I can't see, even when the place is hard. Those that trust, he says, he works all things together for good. Now, don't get it wrong. Some people say, well, I, I, I don't see the good. He didn't say that he has, gives you all good things. There are going to be bad things that are going to happen in your life. Matter of fact, if you've lived long enough, you've probably experienced some bad things already. Bad things. I don't mean uh, just somebody burnt your toast this morning, right? I'm talking about bad things. That make your stomach wrench. Make that nauseous feeling come to you. Make you feel like you can't breathe. Because you don't know what to do next. Or even what the next chapter is going to unfold. God doesn't say all things are going to be good. But the word of God in Romans 8 says that he works. He works, church. In the power of the foundation of faith. He works in the root of even the bad situation and brings about good through his purpose and according to his great love for you. He desires good for you. And he'll bring that good even out of hard places. And faith is that key. Paul writes it in Colossians chapter 2. It's not just faith that's futile. It's faith that's founded in him. How many times did you hear in there with Christ and in Christ and by Christ and for Christ, in Christ. He is the chrysalis. And in that faith in him, he provides the trust that secures the treasure. In this series, as we looked last week in the study, uh, that study of the word brings about the understanding of how this faith is activated. You say, I don't know faith. Get in the Word. The Word is all about faith. See, his, his Word informs us. It informs us as the reason for the reasons of faith. I, I'm not going to go too long in it, but listen, read the stories, the great stories of the men of faith in Hebrews 11 that we're going to go through in a minute. Each one of these characters, by the history given in the study of the Word, each one of them has a monumental, massive, story of faith and it informs you it says to you listen the same God that brought Daniel from the lion's den will bring you out of that addiction the same God that kept Abraham and Sarah even through the years waiting on that child will get you and your spouse through whatever difficulty it's faith and in that place of him being informed, he, he brings us to the next life of surrendering to what he says. Faith in, in the study of the word, it wants to reform you. Faith is what reforms you. You don't change your habits. In faith, God changes your heart. And if you change your heart, power returns. Uh, several, several months ago, y'all pray for old gray, that's my truck, right? Uh, old Gray sitting in the backyard, and I, I just I lay a hand on it every morning. A uh, little over, maybe about two years ago, uh, the engine blew up in Gray, and I, I I I took it to a mechanic. It was it was giving me all kinds of noise, Danny. And I said, "What's what's wrong? Can you can you fix it?" He said, well, "What do you think?" I said, "Well, I've changed the oil in it." It still dripped right out in the bottom. <laughs> right? 
Even change the filter? He said, brother, the engine's blown. I didn't need another oil change. I, didn't, I, I washed it and waxed it. Right? It, needed a new, it needed a new motor. It needed, a, needed, needed the power. Listen, how many, how many of you are just tired of trying to put on a smile? Like waxing over. How many of you are tired of trying to say something of power without knowing that the power really is inside? All right? He desires, right, through the work of faith, to restore you, to, to, to rebuild you, to make you new, to reform. By the study of the word, we see faith that activates and transforms you. When that new heart comes in, when that newness of life on the inside comes, it's not going to be long before the smile comes. As a matter of fact, it's not going to be long before we can even smile into the midst of hatred. It won't be long before we can even give, give joy in the spot of hopelessness. This week, as we look at faith, we, we, we recognize Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a man out of the, the generation of World War II. He died in a Nazi concentration camp along with the Jewish people that were being held there. But Bonhoeffer was not a Jew. He was a defender of the Word of God. And by being a defender of the Word of God, he stood with who he knew to be the people of God that were being in persecution. He went even to his death for them. He wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. I don't care if you're a reader or not. You need to read The Cost of Discipleship. It's one of those works that God has brought through the monumental expanses of a lifetime in Dietrich Bonhoeffer to impact our lives now. In The Cost of Discipleship, Bonhoeffer said that discipleship itself means adherence to Christ in faith and trust. And because Christ is the object of that faith, it must take the form of discipleship that disciplines me to follow. Christ is the object of our faith. Paul says it in Colossians, in him. Bonhoeffer says it's, it's all about him. And in order for me to attain it, I have to surrender of myself to embrace him. Hebrews chapter 11 if you've got your Bible turned there, uh, the first three verses are printed in your notes. <coughs> in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, we, we get this understanding of what's known as the Hall of Fame of faith. A Hall of Fame of people who wanted a life differently. A Hall of Fame of people who, who embraced God for the results of a life made different, of transformation. And we title it that, right? It's the Hall of Fame. I used to think about this confession time, right? I used to think about this chapter in the Word as being almost like a museum of godly people. Ever been to a museum? You walk into the museum and it's stale. Occasionally you'll have the elevator music playing in the background. If, if they're having a, a grand opening of an exhibit, you might have some music playing on the sidewalk, but when you walk in, there's just this somber move from relic to relic from memory to memory. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with memories. Memories can bring you to a place of resolve in the day, but, but memory is not where the power is. And memory is not where God wants you to live. I used to think that this Hall of Fame of Faith well, was for me to take, uh, build my monument, right? Oh, here's Abraham. That happened way back then. Here's Rahab. What a powerful soul she had. But God is not looking for us to build a monument, build a museum around the place of faith. What he wants us to do is recognize that these lives of faith in Hebrews 11 are a foundation that we can stand on and live out the next chapter. You're called in this generation to bring life to faith. And join the ranks. You're, you're surrounded, he, he says in another part of Hebrews, you're surrounded by all of these witnesses. So now, run your race. Take your place 
become the, the living example of the loving and living God, full of power. And that comes in the place of faith. Faith is powerful, uh, Paul says, because of its substance. It is, it is now, in Hebrews 11, 1, it is, it is, faith is now the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. And by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Faith is substance. And faith is certain. I love the way he says, he says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. You ever hoped for something? Um, I, I, I take many roles around our household as the man of the house, right? Um, two of those things are, number one, I am the finder. I'm the finder. Dad, I lost this. Can you help me find it? I'm going I'm to tell on her for a minute. My daughter called me even from Central South Carolina. She said, Dad, I lost my keys. Well, good luck. <laughs> I'm four hours away. But we talked through the process, and she found them. I'm the finder. Still reigning champion. Right? I'm the finder. And I'm also the lookout. Right? Uh, guys, we, we need to, we're, we're going to be starting 10 new small groups in, in, the, in the turn of the year in January. We're going to start 10 new. November, you're going to be hearing a lot about them and joining some. Some of those things will be um, lifestyle. And, uh, like if you like going to football games or basketball games, we're going to have a group that we're going to get those that want to go do that we're going to get together and do it if you like to go shopping ladies uh men if you like to go shopping too y'all can go for it uh maybe we'll do a a, a dip and dots group for men and uh and a shopping group for the ladies right my my wife buys things online through through a business that she has to, and, and so when when she orders something online that she's excited for she's she's anxiously awaiting she's hoping for she'll say have you been by the house is that package there no. Well, can you go by and check? I did this morning. Go by again. All right, I'll go check again. Sometimes I'll, we'll check 25 times. Why? Because we have an anticipation that something good is coming. We don't hope for bad, do we? There's another word for that. We call that dread. We, when, we, when we expect bad, we dread. But God desires good for you. And he says in his word that he'll work all things. Right? What's all things? You name it. It doesn't matter the height of the joy or the lowness of the tragedy. All things. He'll work together to get to that good. And because he desires good, we have a substance of hope. Uh, the word even says, listen, uh, even, even in the worst of tragedy, in death, he says, we don't even mourn like those without hope because we know that joy comes in the morning. We know that God has, has not only desired it, but he will deliver it every time. And he'll deliver it through faith. My job is to remain faithful. My job is to engage him there. Faith is the assurance that it's going to happen. Not the hope for, but the assurance of the hope found in the person of Christ. It's also the conviction, he says, of things not seen. I'm being convinced of those things that I can't even see. A couple of weeks ago, I alluded to a, a passage in the Old Testament that talked about all of the world, all of the universe, all of creation sings to the Lord. Jesus makes an allusion to it in the New Testament. He says, if you don't give praise, men of God, women of God, if you don't give praise, the very rocks cry out and give praise to God. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the telescopes that are looking out into space and recording, uh, if, if, if you're following us on social media this week, look for a video that we're going to put up. They've recorded the sounds. Now, now their magnetic waves, are, they're, they're frequencies above what we can hear, so they've been modulated so that we can receive them. The greatness of God. How great is our God? He's so great that the universe that he's created is beyond even our most broad intellect to take in. 
and the sounds that emit praise to God are beyond the modulation that we can, can inherit and take in. And so a person a whole lot smarter than me, right, took these frequencies from outer space and brought them into a modulation that comes within the frequencies that we can hear. From a comet that's passing by in space and, and from our, our eye, even with the telescope, we see it, but it's emitting a song. It's emitting cadence, frequencies that are, that are in rhythm. And this guy's taken them, and then he's, then he's proportioned them, and he's mashed them up, and he's put them to an old Beatles tune. And one, of the, one, of the, one of the stations in, in that tune, one of the lyrics that goes there, he says, I, nothing can change my world. It's a depressing lyric placed alongside the understanding that the God of the universe who desires good is singing to you that he will change your world that he wants you to have the fullness of life here, here you want to get blown away you want a deeper spiritual truth this morning the God who created that comet, who sings its song as it passes through the universe, created each, each planet on its axis, including ours, that emits its own, uh, it's, it's unique in the way it identifies itself. Every one of them. The God who created all of that, he did it out of nothing. He created it out of nothing. Genesis says that he spoke into the void. What's a void? It's nothing. There's nothing there. And he spoke. And our God, who is more powerful than the nothing, brought out of it creation. And you, when, when, when you're there, right, when, when, when you're in the midst of that feeling that you have nothing, or you are nothing. That same God will, will whisper to us, Andy. He'll speak to us. Because he wants good for us. And when he speaks into our void, powerful things happen. But just like that, that comment that emits sounds that, that have to be modulated for us to understand it, we have no way to comprehend the greatness of God. It's beyond any way. We don't have any of our five senses that can wrap itself around the greatness of God. And so God gave us the instrument to modulate it to our understanding. That instrument is faith. And that resounding song is Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus, at the name of Jesus, demons flee. Jesus, at the name of Jesus, diseases are healed. The name of Jesus, blind see. Soren Kierkegaard said that faith in, in, in the place of, of activity out of nothing, it, it's wonderful that God can create out of nothing. It's wonderful you say, yes, to be sure, but he does what is still more wonderful. At the name of Jesus, sinners become saints. Hallelujah, church. We have redemption because he, in the work of faith, gave us Jesus. And as he gives us that name that's said to be above all names, as he gives it to us, he gives it to us to activate that faith in our life. James says that that faith should be with works. He, he says it this way. He says, faith without works is dead. And you say, wait a minute, preacher. I, I know that, that we're not supposed to, to work for our salvation. That's not what I'm saying, and that's not what the Word says. But what the Word says, that when the name of Jesus is, is, is spoken to your heart and your heart responds, when, when that modulation of faith is right and you respond to the person of Christ, he changes you from the inside. And he pours into you a joy. He pours into you a goodness. He pours into you a righteousness that will work its way out. Um, it's, it's a fountain that's overflowing. It's, it's a well that, that springs up. The word's full of the imagery. 
And, he, and, and James says that if you've got faith that you can hear and respond to the beauty of the name of Jesus, the power of the name of Jesus, it cannot leave you the same. When you go to work in the morning, you'll be different and your faith will work itself out among your co-workers. When you go to school in the morning, you'll be different because your faith will work itself out among the hallways. When you visit with your friends, you'll be different because that faith alive in you will work out and they'll hear the story that God intended. Because you listened to it. We, we went uh, to the Majestic Theater in New York City across the summer on our mission trip. We went to see the Phantom of the Opera. Man. We walked into the place and we said, wow, this, this place is magnificent. It's an old theater and it's ornate with, with gold and, and inlays and, and, and the seats are, are laid out and, and the front is so There's a huge chandelier and everything. It just, it just makes your mouth drop. And I got to thinking this power in this story that Jesus by faith wants to speak into our heart is like this theater. You see, faith is, is the curtain. Now I was blown away walking through the theater. We walked into the steps. We sat down at our seat and we looked and it just blew me away. And we could have left at that moment and said, what a beautiful theater. But the curtain in our place of anticipation we knew that the curtain was going to open right? faith is just the curtain that opens up for the main character to take the stage and reveal the story that moves us man when we're engaged in life the, the things that move us in the story listen that, that, that story is redemption and that, that character is Jesus. And the stage that he wants to deliver this, this, this incredible power from is your life. And it's my life. And faith is what opens it up. Faith that speaks into nothing and creates everything. I had one friend, <coughs> as I shared this idea of God creating out of nothing, he said, he said, you want to know how powerful God really is? Nothing obeyed him. Nothing did. I had to go, huh? Yeah. Nothing. He spoke into a void. Do you get this? Listen, nothing obeyed God. The stars are thrown into the sky. In obedience to God's word. The earth took form. In obedience to God's word. Everything in creation seems to have a built in obedience to God. Except us. Why won't we obey? We sit under the stars and talk about how beautiful they are. Even in the arrangement of their constellation. God has a beauty to work out in your life. So that others can see the beauty of his constellation. The nothingness obeys. The planets obey. Won't we obey? The great question of faith is we know God can make out of nothing everything, but can God do anything with me? Will God and can God change and transform my life? Lord, I want my life to be different. He says, let faith unveil my message to you in Hebrews chapter 11 uh, the resounding question is, can God do anything with your life is a resounding yes matter of fact in Colossians chapter 2 the passage that you have in, in the opening of your notes uh, your homework assignment for this week is look through that passage in Colossians chapter 2 there are eight specific things that God promises in this passage that faith in Christ will change in your life find them and pay attention, the next few weeks we'll be posting them. Faith is, Hebrews 11 says, assurance and conviction. Assurance of hope for things that he is yet to deliver. And conviction of things that we haven't yet seen.
We, we get conviction, right? Conviction is a legal term. We, we, we sit in a courtroom and we wait to hear the evidence and see if the evidence is weighty enough to bring conviction. There's a great spiritual truth in that for us too in the way that we live our life. Is there, is there evidence? Has faith worked in your life to the place? Is there evidence enough in your life that people can look at you and be convinced? That the powerful God who spoke into existence the universe has literally spoken into your soul and transformed you? It's the conviction of things not seen. We've seen him. If you've heard the whisper, if faith is made alive in you, the transformation, now there are those who haven't seen yet outside of these doors. They need to see him too. And faith alive in you is the convincing nature. It is the conviction of a world that still needs to see. But Hebrews 11 is more than a museum. It's a foundation for a faith-filled life today. I want you to listen. If you've got your notes, I'm just going to call the verse numbers out on the side. We don't have a lot of time to break down. Man, this, 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 is, this is the rest of your life. You could spend it deciphering these verses, gleaning from them, mining them, bringing the jewels out of these verses of what faith is and what faith wants to do in your life. Faith is God-honoring in verse 4, by faith, Abel offered up to God a better sacrifice than Cain and through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. Faith is God-honoring. Even when I'm not sure how to be God-honoring. That's verse 4. Verse 5, faith is eternity offering. By faith, Enoch was take, taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God took him. Faith is eternity offering, verse 5. Faith is kingdom rewarding, verse 6. Faith is way making, verse 7. Faith is life changing, verse 8. Faith is ever increasing, verses 9 through 12. Faith is forward looking, verses 13 to 15. It's amazing what it said in verse 13 to 15. It says that those who are mentioned, aforementioned, the promise didn't even come to fruition in their lifetime. What they heard and what they were hoping it was going to look like on the earth, they never got to see. But their faith was forward looking. They knew like we need to know that the ultimate end of faith isn't found in this world. The ultimate end of faith is the, the reunion of heaven. When we all come to the lordship of that name. And we all recognize the bigger picture. Faith is forward-looking, verses 13 to 15. It's kingdom-focused, verse 16. It is test-facing, verse 17. Every student in the house said, Amen, help me, Lord, take this test this week. Faith is test-facing. The passage here talks about Abraham taking Isaac. He took Abraham, Abraham took Isaac onto the mountainside in a directive of God to offer him as a sacrifice. Uh, the, the test took Abraham all the way to the place where he bound his son and laid him on the sacrificial stone. Even raised the knife. And why? Read the passage, it's beautiful. Abraham did it because he trusted God. Even though it looked like he was going to have to face a horrific thing that he didn't know if he could do, he was willing to do it because not that he trusted in himself, but because he trusts God. And God, in the midst of that seemingly impossible impasse, provided what he needed. Uh, the sacrifice was there waiting on them. And again, the joy was with father and son offering it together. Faith. He is test facing. You're, you're facing tests, aren't you, church? Every day you're facing a test to your faith. It could be as little as making a statement of faith in the midst of the reputation in the, in the classroom, in the workplace. It could be as large as watching the life being taken away from a loved one through the, the, the disease or just the, the, the aging of, of, of our bodies. But we're facing tests. Faith is the assurance of 
things hope for. That God will show up even in the midst of your tragedy. Faith is test facing. Faith is God trusting verses 18 and 19. Faith is future blessing verses 20 to 22. Faith is fear facing verses 23 to 26. Faith is freedom finding verses 27 to 29. Listen church, faith is battle winning. Battle winning in verses 30 and 31. And faith is able to carry. Verses 32 to 38. And here the writer sums it up. In verses 39 and 40. Faith is simply better. Faith is simply better. The assurance of what God has in store for you. That you have a hope for. And a righteous hope for is better than anything you forsake God to attain on your own. Faith is better. Faith is better. Uh, we, we, we face circumstances with our own knowledge and intellect. Faith is better. God goes beyond logic to bring the fullness of his power to pass. Faith is better. And by faith, listen church, by faith God avails to us his favor. His favor. I have to remind myself every day, right? I say that prayer, Lord, don't let me do anything stupid today. I, I know who I am, right? And then I say, God, help me to want after your favor. Don't let me want after my personal. Don't let me want after what I can get a hold of. Don't let me hope after and want after what I can see. Because his word promises me in Ephesians that what he wants for me, what he desires for me, is exceedingly and abundantly more than I could ever ask, hope, dream, or imagine anyway. And so I pray in the better. I say, Lord, let me have your favor. My dad taught me a lesson about that one time. Bethany, Papa had us out. We were out at the beach. And, um, and I went to him, and he, he was reaching in his pocket. Right? It, it, there were six of us kids at that point in time. Three of them had already grown and gone. And I was a teenager, and, and we were kind of the, the head of the house at that point. I was the oldest one that was there wanting to go on the beach. And, and Papa reached into his pocket, and, and I, said, I said, Dad, I need some money. And so he reaches into his pocket. He's already got his hand there, and he's bringing it out. And I said, can I get $5? I'll tell you how long ago it was, right? Can I get $5? I want to go down the boardwalk. He said, oh, $5? And he put that wad back in his pocket. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Did you have something better? <laughs> he said, I was going to give you 20 but if you want 5 no, I'll take the 20 right? I'll take the 20 We're good. So he pulls it out. I learned the lesson there. I go to God with my wants, <laughs> and God's prepared to give me the better. And I have to have faith in him. And in that faith, he brings me to the understanding of his favor. We, we were talking earlier about this tragedy that our, our, our nation has memorialized in some ways at 9-11-2001. And there's a marker even there on the sites of, of 9-11, even with the new... Uh, the pools and, and, and the museum and all that has been put there. To me, still, the greatest marker of our nation's um, unshakable nature is found a, a, a half a block away. Uh, it's right off of Liberty uh, Street. If, if, if you've been with us to New York, we walked down Liberty Street to get to the World Trade Centers. This summer is the first time we came in from the opposite angle. But we normally walk from the Brooklyn Bridge across. We go down Liberty Street and off to our left. I have a great picture of Kendall under the no, no standing sign uh, there that's right out front of St. Paul's Chapel. It's a small, unassuming church. It's, it's just what it says. It's, it's, a, it's a small chapel. It's about half the size of our sanctuary in, in, in the square footage. Uh, and when, when you walk onto the grounds, uh, it, it, it doesn't even contain, even with the, the cemetery out front, uh, it would sit in just one little small section uh, of our property. And in the massive New York City, it just gets dwarfed. And, and before 9-11, I doubt anybody ever really noticed St. Paul's Chapel, other than those who frequented or attended it. 
But it has historical significance. If you're, if you're in, a, um, in a place where people are trying to tell you that our founding fathers had, had no regard to the God of heaven, refer them to St. Paul's Chapel because in, in, in the 1700s, George Washington, uh, the, the founding president of our nation, knelt on the grounds of St. Paul's Chapel and consecrated this great land for Almighty God. George Washington did. There's, there, there's a plaque in memorial to that happening at St. Paul's Chapel. St. Paul's Chapel, uh, there, there, are, there are gravestones there. From 1704 is the earliest gravestone that there is in, in the graveyard at St. Paul's Chapel. Nobody noticed it before 9-11. If you stood in the, in the, front, at the front gate at the, at the peak, St. Paul's Chapel would be well behind you there. But, but between here and the parking lot, you would see it, it, the, the, the North Tower. It was that close to St. Paul's Chapel. And when that plane hit, and those towers fell, and the seven other buildings of, of, of the World Trade Center, and the 15 buildings that were destroyed within five, six blocks of, of the Trade Centers because of the implosion of those buildings. God stood a marker of faith in this little tiny church. The buildings on the right and the left had to be rebuilt, but not one single gravestone was turned over in the cemetery of St. Paul's Chapel. Windows were blown out five blocks away. But not one window was broken in St. Paul's Chapel. The people who were there from D.H. Griffin that I've talked to, they said one of the horrific things was all of the burned debris, paper from the trade centers was blown. It was a depth of paper. You, you could walk through it up to your knees with all of the paper that was blown out of buildings for blocks. And yet in St. Paul's Chapel, there was a podium with a Bible laid on it, and it was undisturbed. Not a page was missing. God showed up in the midst of tragedy. And in the weeks following 9-11... When everybody else in the area, their buildings were so destroyed that they had no place for people to rest. For the next eight months, firefighters and emergency workers and port authority and, and, and volunteers from all over found their way into St. Paul's Chapel where 24 hours a day, seven days a week for those eight months, the, the people of God served meals, gave hugs, Gave assurances. Uh, the pews of St. Paul's Chapel, they're scarred from where the firefighters and emergency workers threw off their packs and laid their faces down in tears because of the tragedy that they had seen. And God, through the power of faith, activated by the people of His church, placed hands of compassion on their shoulders and gave them prayerful resolve. Faith is powerful. And God wants to show up in the same way in your tragedy.